So please welcome the Right Honourable Jim Bolger. Thank you, thank you, Sandra. Thank you for that warm introduction, generous introduction. And there's actually 17 grandchildren now, I think the last count might be. Uh, no, that's right. Look, you should keep the numbers up. I uh, don't know there are any more on the way that I've heard, but you never know. Greetings, everybody. I'm delighted to see you here. I'm delighted to see that Murray Sherwood, an old colleague of mine from way back, the Chair of the Productivity Commission, is here, so you're speaking directly to the pen that will draft the report. So be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> to my fellow panellists, uh, who uh, will pick up and um, destroy every argument I put up or whatever, I'm not sure. To my colleague from the University of Waikato in Villa, where is he? I'm not here alone, thank you very much. I just didn't want to be here all alone in just the wild territory of Victoria. Who knows what, who knows what might happen. And of course, while Sandra's got 10,000 troops behind her, I've got nobody but myself. This is an unfair battle, just <laughs> me by myself, Sandra with 10,000. Uh, not too sure. I, uh, <clears throat> the program talks, and I'll cover a number of issues. The program talks a conversation about productivity and innovation in the tertiary sector. And there are many here qualified to carry that conversation forward. No question about that. I will take a wider view and talk of the society and the world our students will enter outside the comfort of lecture halls and academic debate. Much data will be exchanged in the discussion over the time of this conference, but all must be seen, in my view, in the right context. For example, the Productivity Commission, Murray team, notes that the OECD analysis indicates the net present value of both private and public benefits of higher education in New Zealand is among the lowest in the OECD. I'm sure that analysis is in part why the Productivity Commission is carrying out this inquiry. University of New Zealand response, Chris over here, to the Commission is that, quote, considered on their own the completion rates, employment rates, earning outcomes that result from a New Zealand university education are among the best in the world and unemployment rates and underemployment rates for graduates among the lowest in the OECD. From the University of New Zealand perspective, it's the results from the sub-degree level of tertiary education that drags the sector's out outcome numbers down. Well, there you have it. Two perspectives, two views. Perhaps that is so. But from a New Zealand incorporated perspective, we need top quality performance across the whole of the sector. As Ernest Rutherford said wisely, we haven't the money, so we've got to think. And that's what we've got to do on this occasion. There is much to speculate on in the area of education and employment, in terms of the skills needed for tomorrow's jobs. What are they? And when will artificial intelligence take over most routine work? What will we do with our spare time? Problem I've avoided thus far, I'd have to say. <laughs> I have worked harder, but I would it. Yes, disruptive change will continue to happen. But will it, in terms of difference, be greater, for example, than the disruption caused to the people of Aotearoa when Europeans first arrived and renamed their country New Zealand? Would it be greater than that? Maori and the new settlers were required to adapt at great speed to new surroundings and new technology in the years and decades after the European settlement, and that's ongoing. To me, looking out at that unknown future, it is important to remember that approximately 250 years after the refugees from Europe started to note the term started to arrive in New Zealand, much has changed. But much of what Maori held dear in terms of their culture and practice is still held dear today. So much changes, much doesn't. Everything is not thrown out with the arrival of a new set of options, and so it will be in tomorrow's world. Newspapers may and will be replaced by iPads, but you still have to learn to read. These are the things you've got to work your mind around. To me, the recognition of continuity with change is very important as we seek to determine what changes are needed 
and what new approaches should be adopted in the delivery of tertiary education. This is especially relevant with regard to the use of technology in teaching both in the lecture hall and distant learning. In that space, that space is still in the development stage. I was attracted, however, to an approach which was based on the principle that all students enrolled in a particular course were treated the same, whether they attended the class, they were in the lecture hall, uh, or a person attended by video link at a set time and engaged with the tutor and the fellow students from wherever they were in the world. And yes, the distance student could raise their hand and ask a question simply by pushing a button. So they were all in this together, doesn't matter where you're living or where you are. There are clearly some very exciting possibilities in this space and it will be hugely beneficial if our students are engaged on an ongoing basis through their study with students still living and interacting in their own societies and culture in their, own, in their home country. I think that's an exciting possibility. Such engagement must enhance both New Zealand and the other students' understanding of different people and very different cultures. It is great that we have so many foreign students studying in New Zealand as that also opens our eyes and minds to different attitudes and perspectives. But it will be something extra to engage with fellow students who live somewhere else. That will be new. Looking at today's news, and not the Trump speech, but looking at today's news, oh, I thought I'd just put you off that, just in case. They only say there were 11 lies in it. I thought that was quite a moderate count. Um, looking at today's news, we see a world that is deeply divided and deeply troubled by the different values that are important to, and in fact, are core beliefs of large, large population groups across the globe. We don't have to agree with the different beliefs and values we interact with, but we must improve understanding and so help reduce tension and fear of the unknown. Big issue today's world. I freely admit my remarks are influenced by observing and interacting with a world that is challenged, uncertain and yes, ever more fearful. In 1891, the Impressionist painter Paul Gagain left Europe for the island of Tahiti, hoping, in his words, to be rid of the influence of civilization. He went back to the Pacific many times and died there a few years later. Given recent events, it would be understandable if many more would like to go somewhere to leave what is called civilization behind. But I suggest we shouldn't be so pessimistic. Just think of one statistic. A hundred years back there were two billion people in the world and some were hungry. Today there are 7.5 billion people and some are hungry. But that is due to politics, not science. The world has achieved the incredible task of feeding an extra 5.5 billion people this last century. An incredible task, an incredible achievement, and yet we should not forget it. The 20th century witnessed terrible loss of life, far more than now. Two world wars cost tens of millions of lives. The 1918 flu epidemic cost an estimated 50 million lives with thousands, not tens, not hundreds, thousands of lives lost here in New Zealand when our population was about a million and a half. Despite these terrible events, and many, many more, new knowledge led to improved health care, which saw infant and maternal death rates decline by 90% plus. In historic terms, unbelievable progress, and life expectancy increased dramatically. And there was so much more, and such progress is due to the extraordinary research and discoveries of earlier generations of graduates. Extraordinary achievement. Can I, can I just no. Ask a question? No. It, I'll finish my speech, and you can ask me at the end. I'm very happy with that. Thank you. The tertiary sector has much to be proud of, and we should all be inspired by the success as we search for new ways to nurture, and yes 
inspire today's graduates to go out and build on the legacy of earlier generations and help build a better and more just world. We all talk about how interconnected the world is, but that's at one level. On another, we don't seem to understand much about the world outside our historical catchment, or of the ideas and values that drive other people, and so we judge them by our ideas and values as if we are always right. There's much to reflect on this evening and tomorrow as we talk about the issues where to in the tertiary sector. Productivity carries a connotation of economic efficiency, which is what the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, promised that we all follow their favourite economic model, neoliberalism. Last month, the IMF published a report in which the authors write, authors write that while there is much to cheer about the neoliberal agenda, they draw attention to what they call, quote, disquieting conclusions including, quote, such policies resulted in increased inequality and that they undermined economic growth. These are obviously damning conclusions with very important implications. Modern technology has greatly improved productivity and with an ever-increasing world population there is no shortage of demand but thus far the world seems unable to develop an economic model to connect production with demand in an ongoing manner. So the first task for the economic and finance faculties in our universities is to concentrate on what economic model they should, be, they should now be teaching and promoting. What should they be teaching and promoting? I have often wondered after the economic meltdown of 2008-9, followed by the printing of trillions of dollars, what economic is now taught in our first sector. I don't know. I surmise they don't. The innovation I would like to see in this space is for leading economists in our universities to engage in open debate on what they believe tomorrow's economic policy should target and how. We have some of the best minds in the world in universities, but to the outside world their ideas and views are largely hidden. I ask, is this a legacy of the monastic origins of higher learning? If so, remember that not all monasteries took a vow of silence. The issue of economic policy and fairness was picked up by Stephen Jennings. Very recently, Taranaki born, UK based, in an article a few days back. Stephen is one of New Zealand's richest men, yet he noted our tax rules favour the old and rich. I qualify in one. My point is, he has a view, prepared to state it and debate it. We need more of that, otherwise ignorance, myths and yesterday's thinking wins out. We've got to change that. Stephen Jennings was then quoted as saying that a basic principle of fair and efficient taxation was that all income should be taxed equally. And then went on to point out that the taxation of housing and many other assets in New Zealand does not meet that test. He then went on to talk about a capital gains tax. My message is very simple, that we need more public discussion in this area and I see a major role for academics in this essential debate. Dare I say it, don't leave it all to the politicians. Why hide the knowledge inside these walls? The destination of students was captured a few days back by the headline in the New Zealand Herald, It's a Mad, Mad World, with the subheading, Who's Next to Feel Voters' Anger? Good question. Though we still see very little serious debate or commentary about what is causing the anger, but clearly lack of access to necessities of life will be one reason. And if you don't have a house, you will also be angry. My remarks go a little into that area and my suggestion is that an innovative tertiary sector would spend considerable time and effort exploring why the anger and a productive one would encourage our students and graduates to do likewise and seek, suggest, promote remedial action that will help reduce the anger and the hate. Isn't that what we want to do? 
don't want to get certificates on the wall, you want to do something with them. The recent Chilcot report in the UK, which was seven years in the making and 2.6 million words long, threw out the terrible mistakes then British Prime Minister Tony Blair made in committing the UK to be part of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Chilcot report, from my perspective, reached a totally predictable conclusion that the invasion was a disaster. And I might add that one of Prime Minister Helen Clark's best decisions was for New Zealand not to join the invasion of Iraq. The New Zealand editorial, however, wrote an, uh, wrote an editorial on the report under the heading A Cruel Lesson in How Not to Go to War. Yes, indeed. But far more cruel. And part of the reason we have an angry world was to inflict on the Iraqi people a totally brutal war which has caused the almost total destruction of their country and cost tens of thousands of lives and left a country in which there is little hope, as desperate refugees daily give testimony to. Yes, such events will cause anger down the generations. If that is what Christian, civilised Christian Western nations do, they can more fully understand why Gagan wanted to leave civilization behind. <coughs> The many terrible terrorist attacks of recent times would certainly persuade you to look for a quiet place away from the crowd. Thinking of that, Turkey rounding up over 20,000 teachers and researchers after the failed coup attempt is equally frightening. And remember that Turkey is a member of NATO, a military alliance to protect and defend Western values. In total, recent events have created more fear and disruption across Europe and will linger for years. None of those errors, of which there are many, or the tragedies which follow them, which followed earlier decisions, can in any way justify the barbaric acts of terrorism of groups anywhere. Yes, we must fight fire with fire in combating terrorism, but we must do more. To effectively combat terrorist groups over the longer term, we must better understand the circumstances and where possible change them that drive individuals and groups to rationalise terrible, terrible acts of violence. And that's where knowledge comes in. That's where universities and tertiary sectors come in. Just opening the mind to these issues. It's this, however, mad, mad world that our students go out into after a few years of study. Can we, in the tertiary sector, can we with confidence say that the years of study have adequately prepared them to contribute by the way they use their knowledge and lead their lives to help resolve the issues that so plague today's world? Are we confident of that? If not, if not, then you are required, you are involved, are required to suggest what changes should be made. We can't just look the other way. It's not just academic studies to get a plaque on the wall. It's to contribute. Just over two weeks back at my speech to the Higher Education Summit, I suggested that in a world that often divides violently on historic, cultural, religious and ethnic issues, that teaching history, understanding and tolerance should be an overarching goal if the, of the tertiary sector, irrespective of what area of specialist study has been undertaken. In other words, that's the important overarching. Then you might become an engineer, you might become something else, but you have to be, as a part of it tomorrow's world, you have to understand that. And perhaps my colleagues on the panel might discuss it following my remarks, pick this up, suggest how we might best prepare students for this, for this aspect of tomorrow's world. I note that you later have a panel on how unions might contribute as well, Sandra. I welcome that, because all must be involved if we're going to make the change necessary and all must be prepared to change. Let me shift focus a little before I finish. It's a cliche to say the world is changing. Of course it is. And most naturally think of the changes that technological developments have brought and with advanced artificial intelligence just around the corner, many fear the huge impact that could have on society and especially the world of work. We simply don't know all the details but somehow believe that we will find a way through the huge changes that will be required. That's what people believe, correctly in my view. You will notice that no one 
is abusing another individual group about technology. The commercial world, the commercial world may argue in courts over patent rights, but that is not the change that people fear. They don't fear that. The issue that people fear and react to is the evidence everywhere that the personal world they knew is changing. The community they live in is different. And most importantly, their neighbours are different. And in a general way, they are uncomfortable with cultures they know little of. And back to my earlier comments. We've all watched the recent Brexit vote in the UK. And that was all about values. Immigration, not economics, was the issue that was debated most fiercely across the board. The question on the ballot paper was straightforward. Do you want to remain or leave the European Union? From my perspective, the voters, however, answered a different question, a question driven by personal values, which was, who am I? Who am I? The Remain campaign made much of the greater wealth and influence that the UK would have inside the EU. And that wasn't seriously disputed. But despite that, the overall vote, as we know, was to leave. There's no reason to believe that those voting leave were deliberately voting to be poorer. No, in their own assessment, simply answering that different question, what values are most important to me, who am I, when the hard question is asked? Most of the leave campaign material and approach was based on that question. The UK vote reminded the world in a very blunt way, that money is not the only value that counts. That has real implications for any refocus of the tertiary sector. In the UK, the majority made their decisions on values that were more important to them than money. They made their decision on values more important to them than money. It was their identity as they interpreted they were voting for. Talking values is always a challenge, because whose values are we seeking to promote? In the tertiary sector, let me put it a different way. Are we seeking a bigger financial return on the investment? Or are we seeking to instill curiosity about and knowledge of the world outside students' comfort zones? And by so doing, address corrosive issues like xenophobia, racism and all forms of discrimination. And equally and importantly, instill the values that will encourage students to go on and do the necessary research or provide the leadership and industry and civil society required to better address the issues from poverty to food production, from climate change to providing a home for 10 billion citizens. Those questions those questions are to me the core of this discussion because if the tertiary sector is not addressing them then there are no grounds there are no grounds to expect a better tomorrow the tertiary sector we have today is substantially different in size and complexity to what has gone before the institutions are far more numerous and more complex and the students are more diverse in terms of culture, nationality, and importantly, the financial status of their family. Student debt, as this audience knows, is 15 billion. Tertiary study is no longer the, just a preserve of the rich elite. And with that in mind, it is appropriate to have a conversation about productivity and innovation in the tertiary sector. To look again at how tertiary education is organised and delivered, and how costs might be controlled or reduced for students. I welcome the search for a new approach because I have never been good at accepting or arguing for the status quo. I'm always looking for something better. That won't be easy as we have to meet the needs of students, employers and the wider society. The tertiary sector is a big employer, big business, big export earner. And in that space there is another important dynamic which I will conclude on, is that 
in play today. And that is that the New Zealand tertiary institutions are heavily dependent on overseas students for their economic survival. With that in mind, any reform must have as an aim a unique New Zealand offer in the New Zealand market, in the international market, sorry, to attract sufficient overseas students to have both vibrant and viable tertiary institutions. I end by recalling Albert Einstein's definition of madness, which was to do the same thing time and time again and expect a different result. If we want a different world, we have to look at issues differently, propose different solutions. There is no other option. Thank you for your attention as I've taken you on a long journey.